EMD had long suffered from, if you will, turbocharger phobia. This is to say the company didn't want to put a turbocharger in any of its locomotives due to the infamous reputation they had developed. Engines such as the Alco RS1, RS2, RS3, and several other variations of the Baldwin AS series locomotives and RS series of locomotives all were supported by turbochargers and all had suffered major failures. These failures are essentially what allowed EMD to capture the majority of the road switcher market in the US, with its GP9 eventually managing to sell a whopping 4,092 units, in sharp contrast to Alco's best-selling locomotive, the RS3, which only managed to sell 1,418 units in the same exact time frame. It was therefore understandable why EMD would not want to take the turbo plunge and, or should I say, boost, head first. However, things were starting to change. Horsepower ratings were going up, and EMD's very reliable and proven 567 prime mover was beginning to look long in the tooth, having been introduced in the early 50s. The engine had seemingly also reached the limit of what it could give in terms of performance without such assistances as turbocharging. While both super and turbocharging rely on a concept of forced induction, this is to say forcing a large amount of air into the engine suddenly, causing the engine to rev aggressively and produce more horsepower, the way they achieve the forced induction is quite different. A supercharger, for example, has a belt actually driven off of the actual crankshaft of the engine itself. This requires horsepower to be taken from the engine in order for the turbine, which of course provides the forced induction, to spool up. This power is essentially lost and not gained back as this power is needed to actually achieve the boost, and while the engine will achieve more horsepower than is lost, because the turbine is actually propelled by the engine itself, there's a limit to how much horsepower this application can make. A turbocharger, on the other hand, makes use of spent exhaust gases, which would usually simply be exhausted from the engine and have no further use. It uses these gases to spool up the turbine, thus not robbing the engine of much, if any, power. Now these two systems do have disadvantages and advantages. The supercharger, for example, has almost instantaneous power since it's spooling up as quick as the engine can. The turbo, however, suffers from what is called lag. This is to say that the turbo turbine will spool up, but will take time, as the exhaust pressure must build enough to rotate the turbine at a fast enough rate to cause the system to have enough boost to actually have an effect on the engine's performance. The turbocharger has the advantage, however, of providing far higher horsepower increases, as again it does not need to rob the engine of power to generate its own boost. In short, a turbocharger has the capability to produce far more horsepower than a supercharger can. This needless to say is something railroads, especially at this time in history, were looking to, especially in the United States, as trains were getting longer and more power was being required. Turbochargers also tend to favor railway applications much more than they would cars. For example, a car would require an acceleration time of just a few seconds, mainly because it's required to do things such as merge with high-speed traffic onto a highway, for example. Whereas locomotives require no such acceleration. Trains can take, for example, nearly 60 minutes to reach a speed of 60 miles per hour depending on how long the train is, and thus the lag which a turbo incurs in order to get itself up to speed is not such an issue with railway applications. What does benefit them strongly is the fact that they can produce far greater horsepower with this lag, and the fact that this lag, which is a result of the actual gases needing to pile up to spool the turbine up, will actually allow the engine to produce more horsepower in the long run. And so with few options left to increase the horsepower of its now aging 567 prime mover, plus with a lot of pressure from the Union Pacific which wanted a turbo prime mover for its next EMD built locomotive, EMD reluctantly developed the 567D turbo prime mover, initially making 2000 horsepower even, but this output would increase over time. Designing a turbocharger for the EMD 567 prime mover wouldn't be quite as easy as one would expect. Working against EMD was one of the factors that actually made their prime movers so popular as well as their locomotives, their simple two-cycle nature. 
and two cycle combustion diesel prime movers engines etc run into a noticeable problem when dealing with this sort of application. As they lack the final two cycles of a four cycle combustion engine which deal with exhaust gases. In the application of a diesel engine these gases must be recirculated to allow the engine to function correctly. EMD had always gotten around this in the past by simply utilizing a roots blower on all of its engines, which again is a supercharger, which would effectively replace the two extra cycles by recirculating the exhaust gases back into the engine itself. At the same time in doing this, EMD would gain more horsepower from this particular setup. The main catch was, again, there was only so much power this particular setup could produce as opposed to a turbocharger setup due to the difference of efficiency as well as the fact that the, again, the supercharger needed to rob the engine of some power to spool up itself to function. And thus the turbo is more efficient for these applications. There was just one catch. Again, the need to have exhaust gases present to actually spool the turbo and also to allow the prime mover to function correctly as again it was only two cycle combustion and did not have the ability to get the recirculated exhaust gases back into the combustion chamber. Until the turbo reached a sufficient amount of RPMs, to solve this, EMD came up with a very clever solution. It would develop what is known as a geared turbocharger. This is to say a gear is engaged at lower RPMs, allowing the turbo to spool up and do its job of recirculating gases. This gear drawing its power from the crankshaft via another gear. With bypass valves allowing the spent exhaust gases to bypass the turbine for the time being. Incidentally, this is not unlike a supercharger. Then, once the rev band has reached a certain point, the gear disengages, the turbo exhaust valves close, diverting the gases back into the actual turbo turbine, and the turbo functions as a traditional turbo, being propelled by spent exhaust gases, which the engine is now producing enough of as it is now up to speed. In addition to solving the obvious issue with exhaust gas recirculation, this particular application has another advantage, as it essentially eliminates all turbo lag, with the gear essentially driving the turbo until it reaches the proper speed where it can actually function on its own with the spent exhaust gases. This prime mover would in turn be introduced into its new model, the GP20, in 1960. EMD knew its customers and decided to take a conservative tone with this particular locomotive, essentially basing it upon the GP9. Essentially, the GP20 was a GP9 in every way, shape, and form except horsepower output. The engine could even be ordered with a high hood much like a GP9, although few railroads would choose this option, as many railroads found that the high hood limited visibility. In short, GM knew its customers, and it knew better than to rock the boat with something like a new product as important as this engine, especially with this new type turbocharging application that it was hoping to get off the ground for further applications and other locomotives. This new locomotive would also put Alco in an awkward position, as it lacked a four-axle locomotive with the same sort of horsepower. While Alco did have its 1959 introduced Alco RS27 making a whopping 2400 horsepower, this was a flawed locomotive, as it could never get the full force of its 2400 horsepower down. In fact, many of the lower horsepower models the company produced had greater tractive effort ratings than the RS27 did. It would take the company about a year to counterpunch in 1961 with its Alco RS32 model. This engine, and unfortunately once again for Alco, was highly unsuccessful, only selling a mere 35 locomotives in its entire run. Much like a lot of Alco locomotives at the time, it suffered from issues with turbocharging, as well as the infamous piston caps that were failing left and right on the 251s. Seemingly a ghost of the failed crankshafts the 244s once suffered with. Not that the GP20 was that big a seller either. 
Total sales for the GP20 from November of 1959 all the way to April of 1962 numbered only 260 units. This was actually just fine by GM as the company was more interested to see how the engine would be accepted by its customers and or if it would be accepted. This would also give the company a chance to catch any possible problems with the rather infamous reputations turbochargers if anything serious were to come up. Luckily issues were kept to a minimal although customers seemed somewhat wary about ordering the GP20. This could have also been the fact that the second generation diesel locomotives hadn't arrived just yet and most railroads had already dieselized after the rapid period after World War II by this time in 1960, thus reducing the demand for diesel locomotives in general. While locomotive sales of just 260 units were minuscule compared to the thousands of locomotives EMD had sold in one series or another in the past, it was an important seed that had been successfully planted, sprouted, and at least to a certain extent bloomed. It would take Alco about three years to come up with a competitive product, in this case known as the C420, introduced in 1963, and selling only a total of 131 units. This would also be one of Alco's last hurrahs before the company went kaput, as it would shut down completely in 1968. Note the unique sound the GP20's prime mover makes. This has become a trademark of all turbocharged EMD prime movers going forward. In a testament to the reliability of these locomotives and their turbocharged engines, there are still quite a few of them roaming around the United States. A rough estimate is somewhere around a hundred of these engines still left in operation as of the time of making this film. Not bad considering how few of these engines were built. And that's going to do it for this video. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up and subscribe. If you didn't, feel free to thumbs down it. Thank you very much for watching, and as always, keep the metal side down.